for a company called Teamsource. I work with so I work with programming languages, virtual machines, and static analysis. So if you ever so if you so if you ever wonder who are those guys who work with compilers and static analysis and all, well, that's us. So yeah, uh, I guess we can get started. So we. So before we actually uh, start with my talk today's topic, uh, what IDEs do you guys use? I mean, like I'm sure you, uh, most of you write code. So what IDEs do you use? I personally use VS Code. Yeah, that is correct. So there are uh, different IDEs that are available in our Visual Studio. So. There are different IDEs available. I personally use Strider because I'm on Mac OS, but again, yes, you have Visual Studio. You, you can use VS Code with OmniSharp extension and all. So the question is, why do we use an IDE? I mean, why not use a simple editor? Why not simply open Notepad and try that code? Why do we use an IDE? Because of templates. Okay. Okay, yeah, that is correct. So, intelligence and something to combine. Exactly. So basically when you use an IDE, you get certain functionality, you get autocomplete intelligence. For example, let's say you are calling a method. So uh, your IDE will be able to tell you what kind of arguments it takes, how many number of arguments you can type and all. So you get certain uh, additional benefits and these benefits help. Sorry, I'm going to Static analysis is everywhere. 
If you're compiling a program, if you're using an RE, if you're uh, probably using some tools like GitHub, where you have this pull request or uh, CI workflow. Static analysis tools integrate directly into your workflow, so they help you write code that is safe, that is efficient, and that is probably in the best form. So there are a couple of uh, terminologies, just a few, uh, uh, three, four uh, terms that you need to be familiar with before we actually get to the topic. The first uh, term is called syntax tree. Now for example, there are plenty of people here and I uh, want to write down the image. I can use a simple data structure, like I can use problem array or list. But when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the actual program, whatever program that you write, it is not, uh, like you probably have wondered how does compiler exactly represent this program in the So compiler uses uh, something called syntax tree. So uh, just like uh, you have binary search trees, red black trees and all, this is actually a tree where you have a node and then each node you have multiple channels. I'll actually go ahead and show you how this syntax, uh, syntax tree works. So if you uh, look to the board on the left, that is some sample board and if you, uh, and whatever that you see on the right side, that is the actual syntax tree. So this is how compilers uh, maintain the structure of a particular source code or uh, of your application or a particular file internally. So this syntax tree is actually very uh, easy for the compiler or for any static analysis tool to iterate to it. So for example, uh, yeah. so I've just put my cursor on a node called method declaration. And this tool, there's actually a web application that has a conveniently highlighted all the code that is on the left. So if you, there's a method called sample method, since my cursor is on the method declaration mode, a method is highlighted in the field. So again, in syntax tree, uh, you have two different types. The first one is called abstract syntax tree. The second one is called concrete syntax tree. Abstract syntax tree is when only the, your, only the syntax of your program is retained. So if you have additional information, for example, user commands or maybe some white spaces and all, they are not retained. But whereas when uh, you are dealing with concrete syntax tree, every uh, piece of information such as user commands, extra spaces, for example, some people use tabs for indentation, some people use spaces. So uh, all this information is stored within that tree. The advantage is that you can go from concrete syntax tree back to the program and vice versa. But that, uh, you don't have that advantage when dealing with abstract syntax. And again, after that you have IL, which is what we call the intermediate language. It is a byte code. So when you compile your C-sharp application and you compile a .NET application, whether it's uh, C-sharp, F-sharp, or whatever it is, it compiles into something called byte code. Uh, this is called common intermediate language. And then finally you have native code. Native code is very specific to the architecture of your machine. So if you are running a 32-bit system or a 64-bit system or maybe you have an M1 chip. So uh, whatever code that uh, gets compiled to a specific uh, platform, we usually refer that to as native code. So what are Roslyn APIs? Now when you actually provide your source code to the compiler, well obviously it uh, emits a binary, it emits an executable. Now, it does not happen straight away. There's lots of procedure involved. If, uh, there's lot of stuff that goes underneath. So this process or whatever, so whatever uh, process that goes on internally is divided into multiple stages. They, this varies from language to language. For certain uh, languages like Scala, which happens to be a JVM based language, there are, it is, there are approximately 54 stages involved from supplying the source code to the compiler to the final compilation output. So, uh, some compi uh, this what exactly happens uh, internally varies from language to language and compiler to compiler. Some compilers maintain it as a black box, which means they do not expose any details about what is going on internally. Whereas some compilers will happily provide you some APIs to exposing that information. Now, Roslyn APIs are a set of APIs that Microsoft builds, that Microsoft maintains. You can use these APIs for analysis of your program. So I've previously talked about syntax tree, I've uh, uh, talked about IL and all. So these Roslyn APIs expose certain APIs that will return information that is relevant to you. 
so you can uh, uh, provide the source code uh, to the Rosin API and you can query for uh, syntax tree or maybe you want to know what particular variables are declared or what particular variables are actually being read so that's called data flow graph basically like the name suggests uh, what uh, the compiler does is internally it maintains a graph of how the data is flowing in a particular method or in a particular class so Rosin APS will happily give you this information this information is then used to build static analysis tools. So you have semantic model. Semantic model is what main tracks uh, the types of your variables. So it doesn't matter how many variables you have declared, how many methods you have in your code base. If you are using Rosman APIs, you will be able to specify the variable and the type of that particular variable. So at deep source, uh, we, what we do is we build analyzers for different languages and one particular language is C sharp. So using these Rosslyn APIs, we have been able to build a, a C sharp analyzer. Uh, so recently we thought, you know, let's find out the capabilities of our analyzer. Let's see what is the biggest code base it can analyze. So the biggest, so what we did was we went ahead and analyzed an open source repository that that was on GitHub. The repository size was around 2 GB and it had around 93 lakh lines of code spread across 23,000 files. So our uh, C# -sharp analyzer that we built with Rosin APIs was able to run a complete analysis uh, in around uh, 19 minutes. So this included cloning the repository, setting up the environment, analyzing, and then publishing the results back to the data. So the entire workflow uh, happened around uh, 19, 19 and a half minutes. So I'll just go ahead and uh, show you a small demo about how these Rosin APIs work because Rosin APIs are pretty low level. But using these APIs, you can actually build some amazing static analysis tools. So I'll just go ahead and demo it for you. So here's a, a repository that I forked from. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so here is a repository that I went ahead and I forked on GitHub. Then I used uh, Deepsource Analyzer, our analyzer that we built on Roslyn, uh, to run the analysis on this repository. So yes, I analyzed this uh, repository 11 hours ago, it took around 2 minutes and uh, 21 seconds and it came back with uh, 5500 issues that were present in the code test. So let's go ahead and uh, see what this... So for example, this is how... Uh, you can, when uh, using Rosin APS, you can exactly track which node is faulty in the syntax tree. So you can actually point out to your user about where the issue is. So this is, uh, for example, there's this uh, test file and this issue at uh, line number 1558 or something. So yes, you also get these APIs internally for tracking the position sign. So uh, what this uh, issue says is that when you're defining an array, when you've already initialized it, you don't have to specify the type of the array, you don't have to specify uh, the size of the array. What you can simply uh, do is you can go ahead and you can use a new keyword, put the uh, square brackets and then initialize it with the elements. The compiler will happily infer the type of the elements and also the size of the array. So uh, this is a new syntax that is uh, that's been synchronized. Yeah, so this is a, a syntax that Microsoft has introduced recently in uh, the recent versions of c -sharp. So you can build static analysis tools to help your users migrate to a newer version of uh, .NET or newer version of c -sharp. Another interesting thing is not only can you uh, point out to your user what's faulty in their code base, you can also go ahead and fix it. So if you are using Visual Studio and you have written some code that the IDE things can be written in a more better or efficient way, but it usually underlines it and generates a hint for you. You can go ahead and refactor it and it will generate the new syntax for you. So that is also possible. I'll go ahead and show you how that works. So I'm going to just click on autofix. There are 67 issues spread across 13 files. So I'll just go ahead and fix it. So what uh, happens when you actually refactor a piece of syntax is, right? like I said, it could be a syntactic uh, issue or a semantic issue. If it is a syntactic issue, you can simply write away process the ASC. If it is semantic, you have to build the semantic model because 
in large code bases, it is possible that you are using a variable that is probably declared in some other file, in uh, uh, somewhere uh, across your code base. So you actually need to build the semantic model. And since in this case, what we are doing is we are dealing with arrays, has to build a semantic model. And uh, there are also a considerable number of uh, issues present in the code base. So uh, let's just wait. And there you go. We just fix it. So if you look at the def, so this is diff, this is very similar to how GitHub shows you a def in pull request. So if you uh, take a look at the def, this uh, this was a type of the array and the size of the array, but that's no longer required. So we were able to go ahead and fix it. And this happened without affecting the formatting. So if you actually look at the ocean code, uh, there's uh, white spaces, there's an underscore to the uh, variable. Uh, name and all. So all these identifiers, all these white spaces and all are perfectly preserved. So uh, the issue with refactoring is users like to organize their code in uh, in different formatting. Some people uh, like uh, some people set uh, spaces uh, size to two. Some people set uh, the indentation to four. So different people use different indentation settings and all. So it is very important that you handle this formatting as well. Because if you do not handle this formatting, what happens is when a user is using your tool on, let's say for example, a developer platform like GitHub, and if your tool uh, messes up the formatting for the entire file, then, the, uh, then what the platform typically does is it flags the entire file as modified. So you do not want your users to unnecessarily track what is not modified, what part of the syntax is not modified. I mean, your users shouldn't be wor worrying about, hey, I had a white space here, or I had a command here, why did this tool remove this command? Because user comments are also extremely important. User comments are there for a particular reason to explain about something. So all that is important. Now uh, this was actually a very uh, simple uh, refactoring. All we had to do is we had to remove uh, part of this syntax. Uh, so Rosen API not only allows you to remove pa uh, parts of the syntax that is written, and maybe you have a loop that is empty, have uh, an if condition or a for loop that is empty. So not only can you remove such uh, empty statements, you can also replace an existing statement with another statement. So I'll go ahead and show that. So again, this is a uh, this is something that Microsoft has introduced in uh, the recent versions of C sharp, uh, probably a, a few years ago, not exactly recent. So here is a piece of code that is actually checking if the object itself is null or if the object's attribute is null. So what you can do is you can, uh, there is an operator called null coalescing operator. So it's the uh, question mark, uh, that's how it looks like. So you can use that operator to check if an object or its attributes are null. So you can actually collapse this entire uh, condition into one single chunk. Let's just wait for it to come back with the results. And if you are interested, by the way, Microsoft has open sourced lots of analyzers that are built using the Rosin APIs. These are called Rosin analyzers. Some of them are built into the Visual Studio, that is, the, some functionality is available in Visual Studio directly. Some of them are additional plugins that you have to integrate into your ID. So, if you are interested, you can definitely go and check it out on GitHub. It's open source on GitHub. So, how different is it from Sonar? Okay, so that is actually a very good question. So, what Sonar does is, like, as far as I know, so what uh, other static analysis are do is they integrate into the build process. So different static analysis tools take different approach. Some tools integrate into your build process because they require type information about variables and methods. And since the compiler is, has already begun compiling your code, it can straight away lift that information. So this is not specific to C sharp or .NET. This happens in other languages as well. And then there are some static analysis tools that are capable of inferring. Uh, the project structure straight from your code. So if you are uh, dealing with a .NET code base, you have, I am sure you might have seen uh, certain files like 
CS project or solution files. They usually end with extensions like .slm. So these solution or project files, they contain detailed information about uh, the files in your uh, code base, about how they should be compiled, in which mode, debug or release mode and all. So you can query these files to uh, you can query a particular project file to get other files in your project and then start analyzing it. So there's no need for building it. As you uh Sunato provides Sunana analyzer, you can install the packages. Exactly. You can and you can um, like in exactly. the code you can like only get six years. Exactly. The scanner which are using is it commercially free or like uh, Yeah, so our uh, analyzers they are available across free paid enterprise plans. The rules can be modified. Sorry? The rules which you have mentioned change. So, uh, these rules usually in analyzers are uh, sort of like, unless they are open source, I don't think you can uh, integrate your own rules. Most of, uh, most of the uh, commercially available analyzers, they do not allow users to specify their own rule. And if they did, they probably integrate as uh, the third party extensions or uh, some of uh, us may be working in banks or in mm -hmm. private domains. Yes. So I think what you listed was on deep source website. So yes. will we have a local host version of it? Yeah. So it's called uh, enterprise version. So you can deploy it on your servers. Uh, it can be isolated from the rest of the internet. So just like how GitHub, GitLab, they are all on-premise enterprise editions. You can but do you have anything like a Docker machine, Docker deployed by the like an image so that we can self install it somewhere. Uh, like, I'm not exactly familiar. So like any EXE that you provide. I'll take the question, so we work together. So, uh, so the deep source doesn't uh, provide you any Docker images or something, because uh, what we do is, it's uh, it, right now it's a web application that integrates with your ID, uh, with your uh, VCS providers. At the moment we support only three VCS providers that are GitHub, GitHub and GitLab. So we actually how it works is when you see this check happening, right? There would be some uh, when we integrate with the VCS provider, there will be some webhook that will send via the VCS that okay these files are to be analyzed. Then we uh, get these files run in our sandbox containers and give you the results back. So there is no Docker image or something that you can install locally. If you are uh, uh, like cloud is like all free for uh, all open source and uh, for your public projects and even for your free object private projects or something but uh, for your use case for the uh, banks and everything right so self-hosting is only uh, applicable for enterprise like enterprise offering of the users yeah so, so this question is how to provide it and host it inside an enterprise basically so what you provide to host it is it a pure web application so for and we just deploy it as a inside the IS or how it get installed on a server basis. So everything is uh, uh, so or you give an OS image itself that no, you no. just have to mount it on a bare metal server. No, so it's not an OS image. So our all infrastructure is on Kubernetes. So what we give is we provide uh, we provide embedded clusters as well. So whatever you are using in your uh, uh, for your enterprise, right? So there's like very easy installation. So I don't work with that domain, but from what I know, it's like very easy. Like we uh, work with replicated, and uh, uh, it just gets deployed to your, uh, uh, to your servers. Uh, it's all Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, uh, like inside there, like images are Docker images for this analyzers, but we need some like uh, pods and everything to deploy. So I have to have a basically an infrastructure to have it working. Right? Yeah, like some changes have to made in your uh, uh, infrastructure to make it work. There. So if source, how many projects do you support for your project? Unlimited. Like uh, uh, if your project is open source, you can just go ahead and use it for all your open source projects. It's free for open source. So yes, the result has actually come back. So like, uh, like I said, you could actually use the malcoalizing operator to combine uh, the, uh, like instead of using the OR operator, you can just uh, combine the malcheck. So that is what uh, the analyzer did went here. Um, if you uh, look at this particular code example, there's a yeah, there's a comment just above that statement. That comment is preserved. So one thing that uh, you should be really careful about uh, using these APIs is that you target only the specific syntax that you need to fix. That way, 
uh, the rest of the file uh, is uh, unchanged and you are only modifying the syntax that you actually have to modify. Is it analyze the psychomatic complexity? Sorry? Is it analyze the psychomatic complexity on the cognitive complexity? Okay. So this is what uh, uh, so like yeah. So this is what other tools do. So we just launched the service C sharp analyzer back in uh, towards end of February. So we are actively working on bridging the gap. So we hope to introduce tools about uh, complexity, method complexity, or a particular class complexity, and all of the things. So at present we have like uh, 110, 115 tools, and approximately 30 to 35 percent of them can be fixed automatically. So, like I said, uh, here's a challenge that we have actually seen. So, for example, there, there was this particular API, uh, if you look at the second bullet point, so there was this particular API that is actually writing some data to a particular file, and it had a second argument, a Boolean argument, which specifies whether the buffer should be flushed or not after at the end of the write. So, uh, usually uh, what happens is that some developers, they attach comments to literal arguments to uh, tell what those literal arguments actually mean. So, for example, if that comment did not exist, how would the reader know what does false mean or that? So, uh, that particular developer added a comment there, and what we usually not notice, but Rosin and I notice, it, is that the second argument uh, false is actually preceded by a space comment and space, which means after the comment you actually have a white space, you have a comment and then you have another white space. So again, this is something that was slightly tricky uh, about how to retain the formatting, how to retain user comments and all. Because, like I said, people do not want to see their code change unnecessarily. If someone wants to fix a piece of code, they only want that particular code to be fixed. So, yes. Uh, yeah. Do you have it available as uh, VS code or VS so, uh, not yet, but uh, we do have that in the roadmap. Uh, this is something that we are working on. We hope to. I don't have a solid ETA on that, but yes, we are working uh, actively towards that. Uh, and second question, so uh, you, uh, at this point, are you relying purely on the source files, the CS files, or are also are you looking up for uh, the generated binaries? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, this is a very good question because there are certain tools for other languages, for Java for example, there is a tool called SpotBugs, it relies on the compiled bytecode. So there are tools that rely on the compiled, compiled bytecode because uh, you get some additional information or maybe it is simpler, so there are some certain advantages for that. The problem is that when someone chooses to analyze that particular project, that project may have dependencies. So you, before you can actually build the semantic model, before you can actually get the type of a particular uh, variable or something, you have to resolve the dependencies, which again uh, comes at a cost. To, uh, uh, there are network calls being made to Microsoft servers, and dependencies have to be returned to the disk. Compilation happens. That adds a significant overhead. And secondly, uh, whatever apps that we, for example, deep source connects with PCS provider like GitHub, and there's a hard time offset. Uh, it's around 20 25 minutes. So if your analysis, I mean if our analyzer does not finish the analysis in that particular uh, time limit, then uh, that run is not less time So if we decide to compile it, then what uh, happens is there is a very uh, good chance that we are going to run out of that time limit. And secondly, Rosin APIs do not have to compile it. They maintain an intermediate representation internally in forms of syntax trees, graphs like the control flow graph or data flow graph. So there is not really much benefit that you can gain by actually compiling or building on uh, the project. The other uh, some settings that are available only at the uh, CS project, project file, right? Like uh, enabling uh, null reference text or uh, the global using yeah. global using. For example, absolutely. For example, C sharp can introduce something called file scope in space. Yes. So, what how does the deep source no, uh, like if you are not looking up the CS code file for uh, the compiled uh, binary metadata, how do you know that these optimizations are also possible? What do you actually uh, deal with that? So, uh, what happens is that, uh, like that's a real 
very wonderful question. This is something that we have just worked on last week. So what happens is that in a CS project file, you have certain settings, for example, target framework version uh, or the language version and all. So these uh, and an enable references and all. So what happens is that uh, we use certain APIs that belong to MS Build. MS Build is Microsoft's build system. So these APIs will actually read those settings and expose it as uh, as an API for you internally. So you can just query that API. You can get, for example, if there is a, a project that's in uh, .NET Framework uh, 4.7.2, you can get what uh, what its corresponding C# -sharp version is, whether Nullable is uh, enabled or not. So you can just uh, query those APIs and you'll get that. And we bind our rules to a specific C# -sharp version. So people who are in C# -sharp 7, 7 or uh, 8 do not want C# -sharp 10 related information because that's not possible. So yes, we do track uh, certain uh, information like uh, .NET framework, C, uh, framework version, C# -sharp version. And all. So basically, taking uh, the CS project, checking the framework uh, version name, and then checking it out. Are you going to develop the own language packs kind of thing? Uh, no, this actually MS Build uh, API automatically handles it. It just exposes that as a method call as an API. You just need to move those APIs and extract it. So the parsing and all that happens automatically. One more thing I've seen in Zona is the old code, like .NET 4.6, works okay. as is. I mean, but then in .NET code, we have to lower the security of the assemblies, like bring the debug type as full. Then we need to use some coverlet or some XML generator library to generate some XML, and then Sonar will run on top of that test pieces and that XML. And without that, it won't work. So in deep source, we have to lower the security by making debug type as fully. Or you don't have to make any changes. Just authorize deep source to your repository. Our advisor takes care of it. And uh, you were talking about metrics, uh, XML uh, report and all. So you are probably talking about test coverage report. So yeah, so I think that Sonar right now depends on the test coverage report. Yes, yes, that, yes that is correct because uh, 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 analyzers cannot uh, execute binaries and then track what is happening, which particular branches are not executed or something. So uh, if you are using a standard framework like MS test, so uh, they, uh, that framework allows you to generate an XML report and this XML report is par parsed and the metrics are shown to you on the dashboard. That is actually a standard workflow. And even that's how we are doing it. But for binary related and all, configuration and all, you don't have to make any changes. Just uh, authorize your repository as it is and we'll keep it also. Can you show on uh, metrics report? Uh, I don't know. I don't for uh, test coverage, I don't have it enabled for my repository. You can show it on demo. Okay, I'm just going. Uh, Meantime, like how you manipulating the AST? Like after AST, are you building directly models or like you are doing any uh, code vector type of thing? I'll show it just a second. I'll actually demo it. Issues are uh, categorized into high priority, medium, low priority, performance, security, anti pattern, and all. So you get to choose what to fix and what not to fix. Uh, so some of our checks are our custom logic. So uh, there is a very good chance that you are getting more than what you are asking for.
yeah so again uh, you will be able to see what uh, parts of your code are not actually covered by tests and all so again this depends on the test coverage report that is generated by your test framework so this will be on the updated repository sorry this will be on the updated repository uh, commit yeah exactly so whenever you push a commit a dxos run is triggered and then the metrics are collected Uh, I was asking like uh, when you create the AST with the mm -hmm. tokens, right? Uh, so how you manipulate that? Like are you creating the model out, uh, after that or like you are doing the uh, vector code uh, mapping? Okay, so I actually have... Do I still have that? So here is a sample program. Uh, this is what I was showing at the beginning of my presentation. So there's uh, uh, nothing fancy, there's just a source code that I've put it in the string and this is a sample program for, and let's say for example you want to filter out all the method invocations that are present only inside a for loop. Okay, for example you want to see all the methods that are being called only inside a for loop, you don't care about methods that are being called outside. So I'll just show you how uh, you can use a Roslyn API. I've already added the dependencies and all, or uh, imports and all. So what, what you need to do is So there is this class called C-Sharps and Swalker This actually belongs to the Roslyn API So as the name suggests, it walks through the entire syntax through the entire tree and each part of this syntax is mapped to a particular node So uh, there are uh, visitors, uh, visitor methods that are already inside this particular class All you need to do is you need to override those methods and your controller will jump to that particular point. So I'll just go ahead and do that. So there's this uh, method in this class called visit first statement. I've just over, I'm going to override it and I'll just uh, print the note. Let's just see what uh, we are able to find. Okay, sorry, I didn't execute. I didn't call my class. Sorry? Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah, so whenever you are working with the syntax trees, it is all. It is always preferred, like when you are working with Roslyn APIs and all, it is always preferred that you start traversing from the If you start traversing, maybe if you plug out the node and then you start traversing that, you are effectively processing only half of or a subset of your file. So let's execute this. Yeah, so there you go. All that I did was there was a method called visit for statement. I just uh, had to override it and I put a a print statement and now I can see that this is a for loop in my code. So now I want only methods in my for loop. I'm, I'm not uh, concerned about anything else. So what I need to do is so there's this method called descendant nodes. So like I said this is a syntax tree each node has child nodes. So a descendant node means a particular node's child node. So I'm going to uh, visit the for uh, node and I'm going to just uh, Call all the invocations there. There you go. So our for loop was ignored because I asked uh, our Roslyn API to just show me the method invocation. So in just a couple of minutes we were able to write a very simple check that allowed us to extract only a part of the source code from a complete source code. So one more thing is when you talk about methods, classes or that, reflection library is also there and there is Roslyn. So when do we choose Roslyn over reflection? Reflection is something that you would use when you want to query something dynamically within your program or some 
uh, framework dependency and all. You use Roslyn APIs when you want to analyze the source code. So source code is what uh, source code is nothing but string. So uh, you have a file, you have some contents in that file, and when you read the file, you get the string. So to convert this string into the tree and then to traverse it through the tree and all that, for that logic you use Roslyn API. So Roslyn is very different from uh, reflection. Reflection is uh, uh, not concerned with static analysis per se. So Roslyn is a real time. in the Roslyn API, right? Mm -hmm. Project and solution level. Yeah. You might be building a model to calculate the matrices. So, like, is that model is open source or not? So, you mean to say how our analyzer works? Yeah. No, no, our analyzer is not open source. No, it's completely open source. Okay. And uh, what reference you are using? Like, uh, multiple uh, source code analyzer giving different uh, numbers on the matrices. So, they might have some basics. Okay. Where on that definition they are analyzing the uh, matrices. So, what definition you are using to calculate the matrices? So, each particular analyzer relies on its 
its own logic. Yeah. So, which is why you, when you use different analysis tools, you get different methods. That is, uh, there is no base uh, standard or base definition about this particular method should be calculated in this particular yeah. way. It completely depends on your own logic and your own. But uh, you are exposing your like on what basis you are calculating the matrices, right? So issues are uh, standard issues like uh, for example Malibus and all. So these are straightforward issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so it doesn't matter which analyzer. If there's another analyzer that supports a similar check, then uh, that particular analyzer will fly it off. I'm I'm just talking about the definition. Uh, okay. Like uh, suppose Alcom, uh, you are calculating. Sorry. Alcom, you are calculating. Suppose. Okay. So my analyzer calculate differently, right? And you have different uh, numbers. So every analyzer gives their definition inside, like how they are calculating. Okay. Okay. The definition. That form. Yeah. So you have. No. Uh, uh, we haven't uh, uh, published that formula. Uh, okay. Uh, as far as I know, there are one or two tools that actually mention this formula of their documentation. That I'm not sure if I should be talking about this. But we haven't published it. Okay. Do you have to get action to something that you can use GitHub for your scanning service? Not GitHub action. You have to install the app and authorize it. You need to provide permissions to it. GitHub app? Yeah, GitHub app. Because that gives us more flexibility on interacting with your source code. So, more questions? The instance you used as a business target. Okay, so yeah, so this is the Roslyn API namespace. You just need to install the dependency using the web, and if you install it uh, with the you will be able to access it. Well, these are open set of APIs, they are open source, so if you are interested, you can look at how they work internally. So this is in this, you will build your algorithm. Yeah, exactly. I think time is up. Yeah. So that's it folks. Thank you very much for this opportunity.